Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have back in the studio with us, Claire Headley. Claire, welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to be back. Claire, we always like having you. Now, for Scientology watchers who may not know, you were very high-ranking in the Church of Scientology. You were in the Religious Technology Center. Yes. The feared RTC. Could you tell our listeners what RTC is and does? Um, well, RTC, the Religious Technology Center, is essentially the police organization of the entire structure of Scientology. So essentially, it's the, the purpose of RTC was to weed out any kind of external influences, black PR, and keep the Scientology management structure and organizations on the straight and narrow, so to speak, and very simple broad terms that's how i would explain it so they're going to crack the whip over the church yes now i'm looking at the website rtc.org and when i found at rtc.org you can file an online knowledge report many new scientology watchers may have heard of the infamous scientology knowledge report or it's called kr for short yes what is a what is a knowledge report and what happens to it once it's filed A knowledge report is essentially one of the primary um, checks and balances, I would say, that Scientology uses to keep watch over and monitor its members. But really, a a knowledge report, KR, is where you write up any outness observed, any out ethics behavior, uh, any non-optimal situation in the... um, Scientology world. Um, So anything that you see that you think shouldn't be that way or uh, you you know of somebody involved in something that's questionable, anything like that, you are required to report that to the Scientology organization ethics officer um, so that it can be investigated. And um, yeah, so you're required to write up time, place, form, and event and, and report that. So let me give you two examples. I'm a public Scientologist, and I find out that my friend Joe is running a business, and I'm working with him, and he's embezzling money from the company. Would I write a knowledge report? Absolutely, yeah. Even even if, um, you know, I'll give you a good example. So Mark and I were obviously, you know, we were married in the Sea Org. However, there was, a, there was an instance where Mark told me that he'd had a motorcycle accident, and I was obviously concerned, but I wrote a knowledge report on him which he has never for, forgiven me for, um, be, because then what happened is he was taken off the road and not allowed to ride his motorcycle anymore until he received a PTS handling. So even, yes, the example that you give of between business partners, but even within family members, it's expected that you would write up a knowledge report. And if you don't, then there will be consequences for you down the line if it's found out that, oh, so let's say in the example that you gave, uh, Joe was embezzling money, and let's say he then was called in for sec checking, and the organization found out that not only was Joe embezzling money, but that you knew about it and didn't report it. Well, then um, there will be consequences for you too at that time if you hadn't written that knowledge report. I'm guilty of Joe's crimes if I don't report it. That's right. Yes, you would have mutual outrudiments, as they they stated. Now, Claire, shifting gears. Mark Fisher told me that when David Miscavige was at, a, was at Author Services International, he made very good money. And then when RTC was created and he went over there to be chairman of the board, Religious Technology Center, he changed the bonus structure so that people in RTC made more money than the rest of the Sea Org. Is that correct? Yes, it is. In fact, it's very, during the time that I was internal executive in RTC, I was responsible for um, approving their weekly financial planning. And I know that it was very carefully structured so that David Miscavige was the number one earner, uh, Louise Stukenbrock was the number two earner, and then Shelley Miscavige was the number three earner. It was very carefully constructed that way so that you wouldn't have number one and number two being a husband and wife. In 2000, when I first became internal exec, that was the first time that I had involvement in the, the year-end bonuses, which, as I recall, was probably around twenty thousand dollars for the, for Miscavige, twenty to thirty thousand. But then on top of that, for a while there was weekly bonuses being issued 
there were uh, things being paid for, like obviously food, clothing, et cetera. Um, you know, we talked last time about inurement um, and the concerns there. So I don't know that I could even say, oh, David Miscavige earned X amount of dollars. It wasn't that clearly notated on the books in terms of accessibility. Claire, one time when I was at a party at your house in Burbank with you and Mark. Yes. And you told me that the reason you and Mark, uh, you know, could have things in the Sea Org is because you earned a lot more money than Mark being an RTC. Yes. What were some of the monies, uh, amounts of monies you earned in a given year between you and Mark? Like what would you earn and what would he earn? Well, most often what caused that discrepancy was simply the fact that being an RTC, I would get the weekly $46 and Mark very often didn't. So that right there caused a huge discrepancy of earnings because even though Mark was supposed to earn $46 a week, he most of that time didn't. There were months of months and months where uh, Golden Era staff were receiving no pay. Um, and then there were a couple of times, in, well, there were two times that I received year-end bonuses. One of them was $2,000 and the other was between, I think it was ended up being around four or $5,000. Well, when you're earning $46 a week, $2,000 is, you feel like a millionaire. Oh, I can understand that, but, but look at the scene. You as a married couple in the Sea Org, and that's two people working, what, eight, uh, 160 to 200 hours a week? Yes. Seven days a week, you're making $46, which means you could give Mark $23. Right. How do you survive on international base, goal base with, you know, $23? Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it was challenging. Well, if you think about it, Okay, your meals are covered by the organization. So you eat whatever they provide if you if you are granted that privilege. And if you're not, well, then you simply make do. Like with many things in Scientology, you just learn to survive and somehow make it through all that. I mean... Or as they like to say, make it go right. Yeah, exactly. Make it go right. The motto of a Sea Org member. When, when your husband, Mark Hadley, blew... We, we covered that in a, another broadcast. You were informed of it. You were down to, what, 110 pounds for uh, skin and bones? Yes, I was. You, you were under a lot of stress. You're an RTC, and they tell you that your husband, Mark, is blown. Well, they had already kicked me out of RTC by that time. So they, they removed me from RTC in September 2004, which was you know, three, four months prior to Mark's escape. And and we talked about that the reason for that was because I refused to divorce Mark. So in January 4th, 2005, I was in the hole and they, um, they came to inform me that Mark was making his escape down Highway 79. Could you tell our listeners what the, the infamous SP hole, what does it look like inside? How does it work? Um, well, essentially it's two double wide trailers put together. Um, it was always intended as a temporary structure to house management while a more permanent structure was built. It was originally built in, I believe, 97, 98, if I remember correctly, 97, end of 96, possibly early 97. Um, and, and it was, it, so it housed executive strata and Commodore's Messenger Org and the Watchdog Committee. So essentially the head honchos of management is who worked there. And because of that, um, and because those those management executives, more and more as the years progressed, became David Miscavige's key targets in terms of why everything was so quote unquote messed up. Um, and that's how it degenerated into being referred to as the whole. And those executives were restricted to that building, weren't allowed to leave, were required to sleep there, eat there, and everything else there with no access to the outside world, even on that property. You sleep there on the floor? Yes. Do you have like a sleeping bag or? So over the years, there were different iterations of what was taking place during the time that I was there. Um, there were sleeping bags 
hand it out to everybody to just sleep on the floors of their offices. Later on, they got little fold up cots that were then used for that purpose. But that's I, I didn't have a cot. I had a sleeping bag. That doesn't say very much about the Church of Scientology. No. But this is well known, the cruelty, especially in the Sea Orc. One thing I want to ask you about, there's an infamous 1999 evaluation performed by David Miscavige. Yes. Could you tell us about the 1999 eval and how this really led to things going downhill? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I remember that especially well because it, it just so happened that the day that David Miscavige gave a base briefing uh, where he announced that eval, was also the day when I had a very, very serious motorcycle accident um, and broke both bones in my left leg clean through a few inches above my ankle. Almost lost my foot because they refused to call 911 because David Miscavige was on the property. And um, so I ended up having surgery that next morning and I was not at that infamous base briefing, although I know all about the eval and everything that took place and transpired and why it was so significant in the degeneration of life at the imp base. Why wouldn't they call 911? The security protocol was that if David Miscavige was on the property, you don't call 911 because it is somehow deemed a threat to his security. We know maybe, and this is just my opinion, maybe uh, sirens coming would put his case into heavy restim. <laughs> 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 yeah, a little, that's a good theory. <laughs> a little Scientology humor. But he doesn't want to think they've actually finally come for him. <laughs> yeah, the sirens. But Claire, did you did you recuperate? I mean, are you? Yes. Did you I, do okay? I did. I did. Um, yeah. I mean, it was really, really serious. The uh, the impact alone broke my sh my right shoulder. But yeah, no, I did. I made a full recovery, even though at the time the doctor. A couple of things happened. Security responded, put a splint on my leg, and then I was hustled into this little teeny red Honda. Well, that was the worst 30 minutes of my whole life in terms of pain level and everything else, because here am I being driven to the Hemet Hospital in this tiny little red Honda with my leg broken practically beyond repair. When I arrived at the emergency room, Jocelyn Webb and Cynthia Rathbun, no relation to Marty, were the, the medical people that drove me there. And so they we pulled into the emergency room. I was already going into a state of shock. So they rushed me straight in and they promptly spent three hours doing tests to see if I was gonna lose my foot because the splint was too small that security had put on my leg. And so it had made matters worse. And I can tell you, I mean, even even being in a state of shock, I remember crystal clear how absolutely livid the ER personnel were. And um, ironically, they they were definitely animated. I'll put it that way. Um, and they asked me, they're like, who put this on your leg? And of course, being in my numbed and robot state of mind at the time, I couldn't say anything bad about anyone in Scientology or at the end base. So the best my mind served me was simply to say, I don't know. <laughs> you know, and I told them I didn't know. So, and they, of course, were very adamant that next time something happened like this, then I was to call 911. And that's the right sure story to give them. I don't know. And they would attribute it to delirium of pain. Yes. But your story here on this medical transport to the hospital in a private car yes. by untrained personnel is really evocative of Lisa McPherson. Yes. They pull her out of the Fort Harrison on that last day of her life and they're taking her in a private car. Yes. And they, and, and they pass, what is it, two hospitals? to get to Morton Plant right. Hospital. Right. This whole thing, again, it goes to the Tom Cruise. We are the authorities on the mind. We are the experts. Yes. So you don't call 911 to get you proper life-saving medical care. Right. Instead, uh, put the wrong kind of splint on Claire and then put her in a red Honda and transport her for a half hour. Right. Yeah, no. And th this is so bizarre, but it's so... Church of Scientology. It's so typically Church of Scientology. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's a, a day it's, in the life of an imp based staff member. I was by no means an unusual case in terms of how they would treat things like that. Interestingly enough, my when when I 
relate to my uncle who is has never been a Scientologist what happened he he pointed out something that had not even occurred to me is that the I don't know response is typical of abused people it's a typical well, response oh well said yeah that the sort of what's been discussed Scientology members as having battered wife syndrome that's right exactly domestic you abuse know. child abuse everything else the flag that you look for in, in responses to questions is i don't know <laughs> well that's that is very well said yeah now changing gears and, and i'm glad you recovered i mean yes. you're a very important voice to our community out here Thank you. now changing gears back to the 1999 evaluation. Yes, sorry, that was a that was a, no. an unnecessary no, I diversion. But but I can tell you, yes, when that eval came out, evaluation. So an evaluation in Scientology is you establish its use of Hubbard's data series. Um, you establish what is the situation, um, what are the outpoints, what's the why, and then who and, and it names a who, and then you have steps laid out in program form that will then handle that situation and essentially what that evaluation found was that it essentially called into question so many things so many pieces of scientology's overall structure the every organization org board had to be redone all the postings had to be redone um, at the time of by the time of that evaluation there were i think close to 100 people who were on the decks at ogh um, i mean it was literally a, a literal army out there now, can you translate 100 people on the decks at OGH yes. for uh, non-Scientology speakers? Yes. In the Sea Org, you're supposed to be assigned a position that is your post, is what they call it, your job. Um, and that's that's what you, you report for your post every day. Well, if you're removed from post by David Miscavige or somebody else, then you're put on the decks. That means you're put on heavy manual labor, you're restricted to the property, you're under 24 seven security watch by security, um, you're monitored very, very closely, you have no contact with your spouse or other staff members who are in, considered to be in good standing, and you're required to run everywhere, you're on shortened meal breaks, uh, no privileges of any kind, um, and you're in a lower condition. So it's basically persona non grata for a Sea Org member. And at, at the time of those evaluations, there were approximately 100 people that were in that position. The OGH is the old Gilman House. Yes. W what is the old Gilman House at the international base? Well, during the time that I was there, um, it was there was it was pretty much the the armpit of the imp base in that it, it was off the beaten path. Nobody ever went out there. That's where isolation was, which is if you if you're sick and and uh, contagious as a staff member, you got sent to isolation. So isolation was out there. There were some auditing rooms out there. But other than that, it was there were storage containers. Uh, you know, it was dirt and uh, because of it was set back from the road. Um, there were additional cameras and it could be closely monitored by security. That's also where security lived. Now, is, is Old Gilman House just a big, dumpy old house that was on the property oh, when it was purchased? Yes, yes it was. It, it was a creaky old two-story house with these teeny little rooms and the, the rotting smell of mold and wood. And um, But yeah, it was one of the last buildings on the property to receive any attention. In fact, Mark told me that when he went out there a couple of months ago, it had been leveled. It's no longer there. Yeah, I think it was beyond economical repair. Yes. So you have, there are 100 plus members of the exec strata of the church doing heavy physical labor at Old Gilman House. Yes. Well, it wasn't, and it wasn't only from exec strata. It was, some of them were gold staff members. It was, uh, it was a mix of people who had been removed from post. What were what did people have to do? Is this where it famously becomes uh, David Miscavige wants a new org board for the base, and he can't. Nobody can get it right for years. That's right. That's where it started, and that was also pretty much where he he said all the marketing that had been being done for Scientology was wrong. 
David Miscavige had everyone on the base read the book, The End of Marketing as We Know It by Sergio Zyman. And, and was the reading of this book supposed to be the new way of like Scientology 5.0 or whatever version? Yes, and, and, and how Scientology is marketed. Zyman, it says, it says here on the description that I'm looking at, he was best known for reinventing the Coca-Cola company's marketing approach. So of course, not only did Miscavige have everybody on the property read the book, but he also gave them a Coca-Cola, a bottle of Coca-Cola along with that for <laughs> however that added to the impact. It was part of the, the whole package deal. This 1999 evaluation, I've had numerous people tell me it's where things changed, but going earlier, 1996, there's, uh, or 95, there's the evaluation that was responsible for the golden age of tech, the original 1996 version. Yes, and, and also along with that, at that same time, was also when he launched the new era of management. In 1996? Yes. New era of management. Yeah. Well, it looks like... It looks like... Like GAT, you know, golden age yeah. of tech. Well, NEM, new era of management. NEM, GAT, of course, they're infamous for their acronyms. Those were the two huge first forerunners to uh, the 99 evals. I was reading this about this evaluation uh, that caused Golden Age of Tech in 96. And David Miscavige's why was the blind leading the blind. Yes, exactly. If the new era of management in 96 was introduced by David Miscavige, it appears by 1999 it's not working. The new era of management's not working. Yes, but nobody could ever say that because that would be a complete no-no since David Miscavige implemented new era of management. So it's not that it's not working, it was that the people implementing it messed it up, quote unquote. The 1999 evaluation, people are put on deck work, heavy manual labor. What's the aftermath of the 1999 eval? Do new org boards get written? Does the church improve or does it get worse? Oh, it definitely absolutely got worse. New org boards were written, but I can tell you, I mean, I personally was involved in writing probably, I don't know, hundreds of versions of org boards. Not only for RTC, I, I did org board revisions for RTC and for CMOINT, uh, I mean, over and over and over and over again. At one point, actually in 2000, I got uh, the RTC org board revisions approved, but then later on down the road, they were then unapproved and had to be done again. <laughs> yeah, so, someone said to me that perhaps David Miscavige just didn't really want any org board to work because he realized he didn't need anybody yes. anymore. And this was just some exercise in futility to slowly weed out the management strata. Yeah, that is very, the offloads, project also started around that time and that was where people that were never going to recover in David Miscavige's books were to be offloaded and sent to Australia, Canada, other other far reaches in Scientology's world where it was determined that David Miscavige would very likely never end up going to um, so that that he that those people would then never cross his lines ever again cross his path then would you say that the infamous musical chairs was one of the outcomes of the 1999 eval? I don't know. Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say that. That, that okay. came several years later. Um, that, that, I would say, was an outcome of David Miscavige's sick mind and enjoying pe seeing people suffer. Well, that's a simpler explanation to point to his insanity uh, yes. than anything. I, I, I was maybe being too complex and corporate. Well, no, um, I, I understand your question, though. But but I, but I the 99 eval, um, like there were several, there were some 98, some 98 evals. The 99 eval was much bigger and more detailed. And then there was a whole series of like 20 evals that he did, I believe, in 2000. So more and more the 99 eval to me was just symbolic of Miscavige getting more and more enmeshed and undoing more and more of the structure that was already there, leaving everything in resultant chaos. Claire, my feeling was that L. Ron Hubbard got trapped by his own creation. Yeah. Do you think in some ways David Miscavige is trapped by the Church of Scientology? I wouldn't say, you know, I see what you're saying and I would agree with, with that statement about Hubbard. 
I think that Miscavige thoroughly enjoys the position that he is in. I mean, he loves the power that it gives him. If he is in a trap, it's a, it's a trap of his own creation and enjoyment. Is it correct that Shelley Miscavige tried to do an org board for David Miscavige when he was gone and he returned, felt bypassed, and that's when he banished his wife? As I understand it from talking to a number of people that were there at the time, Shelley had, Miscavige was working on, she, she had finalize the INT org board, not the RTC org board, but the, the CMO International and WDC org board. And that had been, by that time, in a state of flux for seven years. So she came back to come in and save the day and get his orders done and get everybody on post. And in fact, as part of that, the RTC, RTC building that had been built, the $30 million, very large structure, was transferred to be the in management building and all of those people that Shelley was putting on post were moved in there. Well, that was that's what sent him over the edge. And he then sent Shelley off for sec checking. And then when Shelley then uh, left to LA to go speak to David Miscavige, it was labeled, oh, she she's trying to blow. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's a no can win for her. That's right. Uh, there's a, a book uh, written, a famous American novel called Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. Okay. It was published in 1961. A Catch-22 is basically a problem for which there's a solution, but you can't get the solution. Yes. For example, let's say uh, you need to do something complex and there's written instructions. However, you've lost your glasses and you can't possibly read the tiny print. Yes. And would you say that Scientology, the Church of, is inherently a catch-22? Yes, it's definitely ingrained with unsolvable problems, contradictions, and logic-defying <laughs> situations on all fronts, yes. Now, Claire, going back to, uh, going back to, you've been demoted from RTC because you wouldn't divorce your husband, Mark. Yes. And they've just informed you that he's blown. Yes. This is taking us back to January 2005? Yes. How do you wind up blowing from the base? Yes, I, I made my escape three weeks later after Mark. How hard was it to escape? What did you do? How did it happen? Oh, it was very hard. Um, I mean, first, first of all, I, I think we discussed last time some of the harebrained ideas that I'd come up with to try and figure out how to escape. Finally, I settled on... Um, what I call the Jan Weiss method. <laughs> it was, <laughs> uh, you know, I patterned my escape off of what Jan Weiss did, which was she, as I, and I, and I was not even intimately involved in that at all. I just knew that she had gotten off the property by going to a doctor's appointment. And from the doctor's appointment, she had made her escape. Well, that, that worked <laughs> for me because I knew that primary target number one was I had to get my, I had to physically get off the property. And then from getting off the property, I had to then figure out how to meet up with Mark. And I, by that time, I had determined pretty certainly, pretty confidently that Mark was in Kansas City with his dad. And I had even, you know, I had described to you how Jenny Linson told me that, that Mark had been ordered back. And thus my concerns and delays on making my escape, because I was concerned that they would get go get him and bring him back while I was making my escape and I would still never see him again. Well, I had actually called, I called up RTC. I called Chelsea Graves and Darnell Bloomberg and I, they were, you know, two people that were remained in RTC and who I knew personally. And I told them, you know, I know where Mark is. And they, they were like, oh, well, we'll get Warren McShane on the phone. And so I talked to Warren. I said, you know, Mark's in Kansas City. Is somebody going to go get him? And they're like, um, well, I don't know. We're, you know, they started hemming and hawing, basically. So at that exact moment, I was like, okay, good. I'm good. They're not really going to get him back. I seriously, that was my concern. So I thought, well, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and test it out and see what happens. And that answered my question that I was good to go. <laughs> well, that was clever. That was a, a clever way to do it. So now, how? Did, what was your medical 
excuse uh, to use the Jan Wiseman method? I mean, did you come up with a cough, a cold, illness? What so, happened? Yes. Yeah, so what I did was I waited until I knew that David Miscavige was going to be off the property because I knew that chances were, even if I had a, an appointment, I still had to have completed staff work approval, which meant CSW, you know, I still had to say, oh, situation. In my case, the example that I made up was I need new contact lenses. That was the best I could come up with because I did wear contact lenses. I was not out of them, but that was the best I could come up with. So I had sent, I had sent a message to the medical officer saying, oh, I'm out of contacts. Can you please make an appointment for me on this day? So she said, okay. So she made an appointment for me. And then, but it was still to me that I had to get approval from my senior and my senior senior and my senior senior and the ethics officer. So I had to have four people sign off on me going to get new contact lenses. So as I said, I scheduled it so that I knew David Miscavige was leaving the property on a Saturday to go down to Clearwater for the um, Fort Harrison anniversary event where they court all of the Clearwater officials down there. They fly in celebrities and they all dance, the celebs dance with the, the wives of all the important people in Clearwater. Anyway, I knew that Miscavige was gonna be at that event. So therefore he was not gonna be on the property, which thus improved my chances of getting my CSW approved. So Dave's off the base going to his big PR fundraising thing. Yes. You're, you need new contacts. So do they put you in a car to take you into town? Well, so here's the thing. And, and by this time I had managed to secretively contact Mark to let him know that I was coming. That in itself was a whole drama that I had to go through because I couldn't email him. I think I mentioned to you before, the only way I knew to contact Mark was I had a Hotmail email address for him. So I I concocted this story for my sister who was a college student. She was a Scientologist, but she was a college student in LA at the time. And I told her, oh, uh, you know, Kirsten, I Mark is on a special project. As I mentioned to you, I was not allowed to tell my family that Mark had escaped. So I told her he's on a special project, which he had been before, and I, uh, I'm not allowed to call him. But could you please send him an email and just tell him that I love him? And if he could please call me at 6 o'clock, 6 a.m. the next morning, that would be awesome. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and Claire, I got to tell you, I love this thing that in... In uh, North Korea, other communist states, they have code words. Yes. And in the Church of Scientology, if someone's away on a special project, that either means they've blown, they're missing, or they're really on a special project. Yes. Such a great, funny word. Uh, because in Scientology, people disappear all the time. Yes, they do. They do. And, the, and, and what's even funnier is that the... The way that I worded my email was such that Mark instantly knew that I was going under the radar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he instantly knew that this was my way of reaching out to him unbeknownst to anybody because there's no other way that he would get such a, a weird message. <laughs> I mean, he's, that's, even, that's like, even with that, he was still suspicious that maybe it was a trap. But it's brilliant because at the base, you're going over the rainbow but to escape, you have to go under the radar. Yes, definitely. Very much so. I mean, you know, and like I said, you know, I I knew. I I went through this in my head over and over and over in those weeks that were torturous beyond belief. And I knew that it would be impossible for me to escape without Mark helping me. And I just knew that. I, I realized there's just no way I'm going to be successful unless I have somebody helping me. And I knew my parents couldn't help me because they were Scientologists and they would be, they would report me. I knew my mom had already told me that my uncle, who is a CIRG member, Frank O'Sullivan in the UK, he's pretty well known over there. He had blown to my uncle, the, the, uh, my uncle Tony that I talked, mentioned earlier. And they were, Osa in the UK were trying to track him down. Well, my mom found out where he was and told Osa where he was. And as a result, he was taken back. Well, you know, and what you're saying, according to uh, what I've read, studies, most successful prison escapes require the help of someone on the outside. Yes, that is absolutely. Uh, I mean, I've never been in prison, 
thankfully, but no, I but you were. I was. You... I feel that I have I can definitely relate to prison circumstances because of the life that I lived at the ant base. I mean, there's nothing in the real world that compares to life at that property. Nothing. Mark and I, after a few years of being out, all of a sudden we realized we're like, wow. You know, I was having nightmares. I still do every once in a while, but I was having frequent nightmares when I first got out. And it took a few years before I realized, oh my gosh, Mark is having nightmares too about the exact same thing. It's like, oh, trying to escape, trying to get out of there. In fact, I was having these same nightmares years before, but I suppressed it so hardcore. I would never even, I wouldn't bring it up in session. I wouldn't bring up anything because I was worried that it would be deemed that because I was having this nightmare of trying to escape, therefore I was having thoughts of leaving. So I never, I never brought it up. At that point, we started asking people that we met up with who had left also escaped from the base if they had nightmares too. And literally one for one, they had nightmares. I've never met somebody yet that told me, no, I didn't have nightmares. Sea Org survivors, the people who escape, it's very common to have nightmares that they're trying to escape, can't get out, trapped, held against will. Yes. That's stunning. It's a, It shows that there's a collective nightmarish experience. Yes, definitely. And Now, you still have nightmares occasionally. Yes. Do the nightmares subside over time? Um, they have, but then also I found that, you know, if I spend a lot of time reading or um, talking about the subject of Scientology, that's will often trigger them to come back. I mean, it's just part of the, I've, I've come to think of it as part of the process of- That's why people online often speak of going through a decompression period. Yes. But back to your escape, you, you've got an appointment to go get contact lenses. Yes. And so, so Mark, so like I said, I got a message to Mark. He then called me the next morning at six o'clock in the morning on my organization phone. So keep in mind, I knew that those records were going to be available. Um, and I knew that they'd been checking them because I'd had, I'd been called in to say, oh, you need to stop calling Mark. Security is dealing with this now. Um, anyway, all of that to say, I knew that I was taking a very serious risk by having this phone call, but um, but the outweighing factor was that I knew my escape would not be successful unless I could get Mark's help. So I told Mark, I said, Mark, I'm I'm dying here. I'm not. I'm cannot stay here. And he, of course, was like, Oh, what about your family? I said, No, I've thought about it. I I I can't. I can't do this. I love you. I want to leave. I'm. I'm going to die if I stay here. I mean, I, seriously, I was absolutely borderline suicidal. Uh, like I told you, by that time, I was under 100 pounds. I could not eat, could not sleep. Um, I was a wreck. I understood. Yeah, and I knew, I knew really, when I really boiled it down, I knew that that this was a moment in my life where I had a decision to make. And if I made the wrong decision, I would regret it for the rest of my life, like, absolutely no question in my mind i knew that i had to make my decision and act on it claire i'm glad you said that because so many people at least a dozen have told me that escaping sea org was a life or death situation yes absolutely I, you know literally the, where they were so physically ill yes candida uh, untreated medical conditions that if they didn't go they were going to physically die yes yeah i so, thought i thought i had cancer because um, I had adrenal gland exhaustion. My adrenal glands were rock solid. But we, I think we had talked about that part. But, but yeah, no, I absolutely, and I also knew it's, I think what, what's hard to un understand from the outside is that when you're in that world, people have asked me so many times, oh, why didn't you escape earlier? Well, it's hard to understand that when you're in that world, the easiest thing to do is follow the path of least resistance, which is just to go along, get up in the morning, do, you know, do whatever it is you're told to do. The hardest thing to do is to break out of that. And break out of that is literally physically and emotionally every aspect of that. I mean, essentially to escape from that. It's not just a matter of, oh, let me get in my car. I don't have a car. Let me drive to my family. Oh, I don't have family because they're in Scientology. Let me go to another job. Oh, I don't have a job. Wait a minute. What should I do? Um, oh, let me go apply for a job. Hi, I'm Claire. Uh, yeah, I've been in a cult for 15 years. Please hire me. <laughs> you know, 
it's just really, if you think about it, it, it that's where it's, it's such an all-inclusive, isolated life that it's very, very hard to not only envision leaving, but then actually take the physical steps required to leave and do so successfully without being caught. I mean, there's layer upon layer upon layer of complexity involved. Claire, and that's by design. The Church of Scientology designs Sea Org by design so you have as few rights as possible. Many people don't have a driver's license. Yes. You know, Camilla Anderson was 48 years old and out of the Sea Org before she learned to drive. Yes. She didn't even know how to drive. So you're financially broke. Yes. You have little or no money. You often don't have family, as you said. Yeah, you have no and credit. And people don't understand all the indoctrination. It, it's it's a whole structure and consciousness, your identity, your being, your friends. I mean, everything. Yes. And at, at the it's, end base, they would frequently go on and on about, oh, if you leave, then you're going to end up flipping burgers at Burger King. Uh, you're not, you're going to just be, you know, they would often tell stories about people who had escaped that, oh, they're, they're uh, with prostitutes and drug dealers and heavy drugs and, oh my gosh, nightmare stories that nine times out of 10 were completely and utterly fabricated. Yeah, and this is also a repeated theme I'm hearing. Yeah, if you leave, you're going to be flipping burgers at McDonald's or Burger King. Yes. People are smoking pot. They've gone into very, de they become degraded beings. Yes. So psychologically, you know now it's life or death and you don't care. Yes. You, what happened on the 6 a.m. call with Mark that Saturday morning? So I told Mark, I said, Mark, I, I'm not going to make it. I'm coming. He said, oh, OK, well, on Sunday, norm in a normal situation, every Sunday, staff would go to their birthing in town or in my case, in, on Sublet Road outside of the property, but would be off the property and could then make a phone call and call a cab. So he said, oh, well, on Sunday when you're doing CSP, that's when we, you would have a two hour slot to do your personal laundry and clean your room. He said, well, on Sunday, just call a taxi and no matter what, just get in the taxi and go to the Riverside bus station. And I said, well, that's not gonna work. He said, well, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, I'm restricted to the base. He's like, <laughs> his comment was, wow, <laughs> it's really true. Things are getting better. <laughs> his sarcasm always made me laugh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because because a week before that, I'd had a phone call with him that was with security in the room to try and get him back, where I tell, told him, oh, Mark, you're going to go back on post, and David Miscavige ordered you be, you know, forgiven for what you've done, and you're going to come back, and you're going to get all these new people in your area. That's what I told him two weeks before that, or a week before that. Well, now here I am with unfiltered communication telling him, Mark, I need to get the hell out of here right now and I need your help. I'm, I cannot do this by myself. So that's where he was like, wow, yeah, things really are getting better, aren't they? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's so typically Mark. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, oh, go ahead, rub it in, why don't you? Uh, yes, I need your help. <laughs> it sucks here. <laughs> yeah, so how, how did you get off the base? So, um, so then he, he told me, so he had that idea and I told him that wasn't going to work. I said, okay, but I do have this appointment with the eye doctor on Monday morning at 1015 and I'm supposed to go and, and get new contact lenses. So he said, okay, go to that appointment and call a cab and make it to Riverside bus station and then call me from there. Claire Headley has to make it to the Riverside bus station in order to escape hell at Scientology's infamous international base in San Jacinto, California. Due to the unpredictable nature of life at the base, how does she do it? That'll be the next part of Claire Headley's story of her escape from M base. Claire, thank you for being on our show today. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is Jeffrey Augustine. We are available at survivingscientologyradio.com, on YouTube, and on iTunes. For Surviving Scientology Radio, thank you.